set as a goal increasing practically productivity by 20% and lowering the number of staff by 20%, and you'll have a serious impact on the financial standing of universities. Today, most colleges hire new junior faculty at about the age of 29 when they are newly minted PhDs at the blush of early promise. These baby scholars come up for tenure in their sixth or seventh year of teaching at about age 35. And at that point, the university is asked to make what is now about a 40-year-plus contractual arrangement with each person. We, as you know, the federal government has made it impossible for us to maintain a mandatory retirement age as a result of the Federal uh, Age Discrimination and Employment Act. So the earlier tradition of a faculty member getting a tenured slot at age 35 and then teaching for 30 years until age 65 is gone. Few professors now retire before their early 70s. I myself am 74, self-declaration, transparency, and many remain in their positions far longer. Well, not 74 till next week, but all right. And many remain in their positions far longer for the simple reasons that people's lifespan has increased, the job comes with a decent salary, <coughs> it's indoors in the winter, uh, you can walk around in the summer, there's health care coverage, dental, and the relaxed teaching load that accompanies senior faculty, frankly, doesn't require heavy lifting. Who would voluntarily give this up? Well, not me, as you can see. Tenure, or as we can call it, lifetime employment contracts, lock in the higher ranking, higher earning faculty at great expense to the institution on a financial level and programmatically because it stifles young blood. By remaining on the jobs, for decades longer than before, there are fewer and fewer slots available for new hires. There's a growing mountain of newly minted scholars with doctorates and no place for them to teach. Our relationship of production to necessary to market is Soviet in its, uh, in its uh, uh, madness. Uh, so uh, we are graduating probably eight PhDs in history for every job that comes available in the fall and the other seven trying to figure out what to do with their lives. No single university can radically alter tenure because of what I call the appearance of relative deprivation. If, for example, GW were to eliminate tenure and move to an innovative stepped-up contracting system, faculty being recruited by the institution would look at the benefit packages being offered up the street at Georgetown, and they'd say all things being equal, I'd rather teach at uh, Georgetown or American, where they still have tenure, than at GW where it's no longer given. Now, if the California State College system or the New York State campus system 64 campuses in New York State, would have changed the tenure process, then you'd see a serious inroad into the ability of other colleges to join the bandwagon. This is a case where there's going to be, have to be comfort in numbers. Traditionally, tenure provides two things, the famous job security and the academic freedom. And that may have made uh, some sense at one time when John Dewey was still with us. But I no longer believe that tenure is required to protect free speech. Our courts are more than adequate to take care of that. As for job security, well, yes, yes, here I am sure that GW would not retain me if I, uh, if I didn't have tenure. Well, I'm not sure, but I, I'm confident. Uh, it's a good thing, but we have to weigh several factors when discussing its role on campus. The present length of employment that I referred to, uh, to above makes it virtually impossible to hire young faculty without increasing the overall size of the faculty, and the extra years that faculty stay on the job after 65 has contracted the ability of fresh PhDs to find academic employment, and this is a tragedy at several levels. Youth does, in fact, bring new ideas and fresh approaches to the disciplines. Youth does, in fact, bring energy. Yes, uh, I may be older and maybe even wiser, but the productivity of faculty greatly diminishes in many fields uh, after the age of uh, 50. The first 30 years grow far greater works of literature and history and biology and physics and math and chess uh, where they peak at 30. We have an obligation, it seems to me, to refresh our supply of scholars and scholarship. There are, of course, creative ways to structure buyouts for senior faculty. I'll give you one example. For sake of easy math, let's say Professor X makes $100,000 a year. If she voluntarily retired, assume her pension would provide 50% of her salary or 50000 the university could offer to make up the difference for some period of time, let's say $50,000 for two or three years, and continued health insurance in exchange for teaching one class. Let's say uh, then $40,000 for a year, then $30,000 at the end of five years, $20,000. With the differential of what the university is paying Professor X 
from the original 100,000, a younger faculty member can be hired and you'd still have whatever contributions the older faculty member continued to teach. Young faculty uh, earn less per annum than do the senior faculty. If you reduce the number of senior faculty and increase the number of younger faculty, the total salary line will be less than the pool uh, if the pool is top heavy and the students will have access to more faculty and more choices. Faculty are rewarded for the, with the benefits of time. Most teach nine months a year and have June, July, and August available for reading, writing, excavating, or sitting on the beach. The more senior the faculty member, the less classroom teaching they generally often undertake. The ever-reduced teaching loads have given rise to increase in the number of adjunct faculty to cover the work that needs to be done in the classroom. And while this is healthy in some disciplines, and in some areas like GW, very rich in adjunct faculty in the Washington area, more isolated fa uh, campuses do not have those uh, opportunities. Overall, the growing lot of adjuncts are a group of unhappy, financially insecure academics. And this situation is not good for the attitude they bring to the classroom or for higher education. Next point. Too many universities aspire to become major research schools, the equivalency of being a member of AAU, the organization that now has 34 members, but hundreds of aspiring candidates. I kept trying to get GW into AAU. At schools that want to get into this organization, it's fairly common to reward faculty members involved in serious research with a reduction in the teaching assignments to give more time to the laboratory or the library. This has translated into a norm that says something like, you're on a university-wide task force, teach one class less in the fall. You are writing a magnum opus, offer one class less, uh, less than uh, the average. 25 years ago, the average course load was what was called 3-3 or 3-2, depending on the discipline. And today, it's more like 2-2. And many at law schools are teaching 2-2 or 2-1. Reduced teaching it becomes, over time, seen as a right. And by that, I mean almost all faculty get a reduced load, not only the one who's actually producing the research. And new faculty are frequently hired seduced to come to your university rather than elsewhere with the promise that their teaching loads will be light, not heavy. Think of the irony. The dean says to a candidate, you're really wonderful. We want you to come join us, and you'll hardly have to, have to, have to teach a class. What a message that sends to a new faculty member joining a campus. So in the ideal environment, I'd like to propose a two-tier system of equals, a silo of faculty members that teach and get rewarded with raises and promotion and tenure, primarily by virtue of their classroom performance, and secondarily by their research and campus service, and another cohort of faculty that teach less than the others, but who produce more research, books, whatever it is we want from them. This group would get raises, promotions, and tenure primar primarily by virtue of their scholarly activity, and secondarily by their teaching and their campus service. Compensation could be equal, but we could put the best teachers in front of the students, and by best, I'm simply meaning people who want to be there, and often put the best writers in front of a computer with more time to scribble, scribble, and scribble, and do their uh, scholarship. Along with the problems incurred with increased seniority is the, in the professoriate and the lifetime contracts, and of course the loads, we have to add the present faculty equation, the academic calendar, which at most schools is divided into two 14-week semesters for a total of 28 weeks of direct student-to-student -student faculty member contact. That leaves us 24 weeks when a formal semester-long teaching does not occur. If your physical plant is worth a billion, two billion dollars, as GW's may be, uh, that's a lot of, uh, of uh, sunk costs that aren't being utilized. I cannot imagine any other uh, enterprise in America that uses its, uh, its resources in that way. And for many years, I've been proposing changing the academic calendar from two to three semesters a year. And the faculty presently teach two, two, uh, two courses each of two semesters, or two one for a total of three or four courses a year, and we put in a third semester, productivity would rise, adjuncts would be reduced, students could complete their degrees in less time, translate that into less tuition. If students enroll in four courses a semester for three semesters a year, it comes to 12 courses a year, and if followed the same formula for three years, they would have completed 36 courses to qualify with a bachelor's degree. The present scenario, four classes each term for two terms a year, or eight classes over a four-year period, equals only 32 classes. We could require then 36 courses, in which case we will be giving a student more education in three years than we presently do in four, or if we stay with 32 classes, the student could take off a semester for a full-time work or internship or study abroad 
and enrich their uh, lives and their education in other ways. For many reasons, most faculty members are not keen on this idea. Uh, at GW, where I proposed the idea, the Faculty Senate refused to put it on the agenda. I couldn't get them to take a vote. And I realized that lots of details need to be worked out and to be enacted on every, any given campus. It would be in incrementally phased in. A set of new contracts adjusted by discipline would have to be drawn up. And the possibility of allowing faculty to rotate in and out of the plan or have an occasional semester off for research, perhaps every five rather than seven years, as is presently the case for sabbaticals. But this is a concept that's time is uh, coming. Again, my goal is to increase faculty productivity by 20 percent, reduce the number of administrative staff by 20 percent, along with these two modifications, change the academic calendar. Now, I want to take a word on uh, uh, professional staff before I close down. Over the past decades, several factors have contributed to the growth of the staff positions at America's colleges and universities. I call this the Charles Dickens complex. Please, sir, may I have some more, says Oliver Twist. In the post-1960s world, colleges have greatly expanded the services and facilities provided to undergraduate students, partly in order to attract the baby boomers who flooded the college gates from the 60s to the 70s, and then in response to the rise in the cost and price of education, uh, which induced parents to say, for this kind of money, my kids should be getting gourmet food, relaxing at a uh, health club, and studying at a library that's open 24 hours a day. My non-scientific observation is that the higher the ranking of the school, let's take a look at Ivy League campuses, the less likely the administration is to pay any attention to the students' uh, or parents' desires for more. The letter of admission is the more. Society's stamp of approval that one is now a member of the club. <clears throat> I knew somebody who went to a place other than Harvard, but nevertheless, had framed and hung in his office his letter of admission to Harvard. Uh, <laughs> uh, he had the key to the gate. He just chose to go someplace else, but I loved it. It's a great story. When my, uh, when my son, uh, Adam, arrived at Columbia's Morningside Heights, uh, my wife went into the bathroom to use the facilities, and she came out and she said, go immediately across the street to the hardware store and buy cleaning supplies. She says, this place is filthy. So I, I went to Columbia myself. Uh, I took great umbrage at Francine's remarks, so I ignored her. And I stayed in the room, and I hung around. Uh, and, uh, and at some point, nature called, and I went into the bathroom, <laughs> and I came out, and I said, I'll be right back. <laughs> I'm going across the street to the hardware store. Uh, it was, as my mother would have said in Ippish, a sewer. Uh, so now fast forward a few years. And my son Ben arrives in New Haven for his first day at Yale College. And we're right behind him. And we're schlepping in the suitcases and the computer supplies. And it's a dark, dreary, rainy New Haven morning. And the first thing Francine does when she walks into the room, because it's like this, you know, but not the lights. She, she wants to turn on the lights, but she can't find the switch. No lights. Nada. Nary a single bulb. Not even an empty socket. Now, if it turns out if an Eli doesn't bring his own illumination, he spends four years in the dark. <laughs> Trust me, neither of these scenarios could ever occur at George Washington University, where the dormitories are better than Marriott hotels. I know. I built them all. And, uh, and, uh, and because we are consumer responsive in a way that the Ivy League institutions are not obliged to be, we are competing with Boston University. And, uh, and the parents will say to me, at Boston University, uh, they have a new dormitory. And I know, because I built them. So uh, having spent uh, years as a vice president at Boston University and now uh, years as a president at GW, I have some sympathy to the aspirations of uh, middle class and upper middle class parents and their belief that great universities have livable residence halls uh, and, uh, and uh, they will succumb to the seduction of the name Harvard uh, because uh, they, it's, it's sort of like a cross in one of those, in one of those uh, vampire movies. When they meet people at the country club and the people say, where is your son at school? If you can hold up and say, Harvard, well, the vampire backs off. But if you, uh, if you say George Washington University, they say, how are the dorms? Right? <laughs> so so uh, you don't have to say another word if your kid's going to Harvard. Yes, I'm going to Harvard. <laughs> um, and how are you paying for that? Oh, we got grandmother working the streets. But, 
But, but if you're sending your kid to GW, you damn well better give him a good dormitory room. So universities now uh, offer health and wellness facilities that rival spas, football, food that, that gets Michelin stars. Uh, in the Princeton Review, they used to get little for forks and knives next to the names of the universities. There are outdoor, outdoor basketball courts for quick pickup games, student unions with bowling alleys. We've got a bowling alley at GW. Health services to dispense free flu shots. God forbid they should have to walk over to CVS. There are services to help the student cope with the uh, transition from home to campus, with the difficulties of living with roommates who exhibit erratic behavior, with advice on how to study and how to rewrite a resume, placement offices that coach students on how to find a job. There are remedial programs for those students who skipped their high school classes when grandma was being taught, who never learned how to write an outline for a term paper on the modern equivalent of a four by six white index card. My personal uh, uh, favorite support service is not for students. It's for the parents. In my day, forgive me, I'm getting to be an old guy. I, in my, I, I ought to get on 60 Minutes. In my day, in my day, parents didn't know the name of my dean. And if they did, they never would have, under any circumstances, considered calling, calling Lawrence Chamberlain and saying, Dear Stevie, isn't doing as well in Lionel Trolling's English class as I was hoping. Would you please contact the professor and see what can be done to help him raise his grade? The deal I had with my parents was that I was to call home once a week. If I didn't call home, my father didn't send the $10. That was the deal. Today's kids call home everyone. Call home every day for hours. Every day, parents come to town to restock the students' kitchens, to take home the winter clothes, bring new items to wear for the spring. I knew a campus mother from Athens, the one in Greece, who came to Washington twice a semester, registering for three days across the street at the Four Seasons in order to reorganize her son's apartment. She cleaned, she shopped for food, she cooked meals that she would freeze and leave in the, in the, uh, in the refrigerator. When I pointed this out, that given the cost of the airfare, she could have hired somebody in Washington to do these services, she looked at me and she said, a Greek, a Greek mother takes care of her sons, we don't delegate that to others, and I now see where that leads. <clears throat> There has been a bloating of the middle class on campus for 25 years. A rise in the number of professional staff members, a significant growth in the advancement, what used to be called fundraising, development, in public affairs and media, which used to be called PR, in student support services, which was once called admissions and financial aid. Hundreds, hundreds of people now raise annual funds. Hundreds. Dozens of people write press releases, build websites, and answer questions from the media. And what used to be a small office with a dean of admissions and financial aid has morphed into a mega conglomerate with the largest component of administrators at the university. I knew I was coming here, so I surfed the web of uh, uh, sites of several local universities. And here's a list of offices, each comprised of many staff people, I assure you, that report up the ladder to various senior vice presidents. As admissions, at at athletics and recreation, campus recreation, the first, of course, is team sports. The second is uh, uh, non-NCAA fitness. There's a career center. There's an alcohol and drug education center. There's a center for civic engagement and public service. There's a center for student engagement. I'm not sure if that has to do with you know, putting boys and girls together. Whatever that is, student engagement. There's a counseling center. There's a dean of students. There's a disability support service office. There's a financial assistance office. There's a housing program. There's international services. There's multicultural student services off-campus student affairs, Office of Civility and Community Standards. I'd like to look into that one. Office of Student Rights and Responsibilities. There's a Parent Services Office. There's a Student Academic Success Office. There's a Student Health Office. There's an Office of Veteran Services. The three areas with the largest growth of professional staff have been in student services, compliance regulation. Federal government passes a lot of laws, <coughs> a lot of compliance obligations, non-funded mandates and in development, institutional advancement, as the institutions have gotten more pricey, more expensive, more, they've gotten more people to go out and knock on doors, and their assumption is, if you spend a dollar and you raise a dollar and a penny, you're a penny ahead. Over the past decades, universities have been the beneficiary of a series of federal unfunded mandates, services that have to be provided and reported about in order to make life on campus more transparent. Compliance officers gather information and write reports in the areas of research grants, personnel, public safety, student life, many other things. Each segment of campus life is now affected by example, how do we comply with the Americans with Disabilities Act, the reporting of crimes, 
how grants are administered, personnel and discrimination, how many minorities are hired, how long it takes athletes to graduate, benefit management, and so on and so on. Each requires a compliance officer and a compliance office. After 9-11, the federal government mandated several new student visa requirements and many campuses also enacted additional safety procedures. All of this was done because it was the right thing to do, but none of the additional requirements came with appropriated dollars. Undoubtedly, changes in campus security came about after the incident at Virginia Tech, but nobody offered to pay for them. And many more will inevitably follow from Penn State. When the campus women's group came to see me about opening a daycare facility, I couldn't come up with a response other than yes, for the request made sense. But the solution didn't come for free. When gay advocates asked me that marital benefits be provided to partners, I did it because it seemed to me right and just, but it didn't come for free. Older benefits, like health care, have risen significantly in cost. Faculty are teaching less, except at community colleges and almost all disciplines. Professional staff are proliferating in many areas of university life. Benefits for all employees are increasing in scope and cost. A national, a national health care system for everybody with lower institutional costs across the board <coughs> and help stabilize budgets. It would lower tuition, just as I believe would be the lower cost of a car produced in Detroit. But that's another uh, talk. Higher education is in need of financial and governance reform. About that, I think we all agree. It's the methodology to put it in place that makes for a robust post-lunch conversation. Thank you very much for your attention.